is a lot of times people buy on the basis the stock has gone down this much. How, you know, how much further can it go down? I remember when Polaroid went from 130 to 100, people said, here's this great company, great record. If it ever gets below 100, you know, just buy every share, you know, and it did get below 100. A lot of people bought on that basis saying, look, it's gone from 135 to 100. It's not 95, what a buy. Within a year, it was 18. And this is a company with no debt. I mean, this is a company, it was just so overpriced, it went down. Uh, I did the same thing in my, uh, I think my first or second year of Fidelity. Kaiser Industries had gone from $26 a share to 16. I said, how much lower can it go? It's 16. So I think we bought one of the biggest blocks ever on the, New York, on the American Stock Exchange of Kaiser Industries at 14. I said, you know, it's gone from 26 to 16. How much lower can it go? Well, at 10, I called my mother and said, Mom, you got to uh, look at this Kaiser Industries. I mean, how much lower can it go? It's gone from 26 to 10. <laughs> well, it went to 6, it went to 5, it went to 4, it went to 3. And uh, now I am fortunate this happened rapidly. I would probably be still caddying or uh, being, being, uh, working at the stop and shop, but I, it happened fast. So I was able to, it was compressed. It, uh, and at 3, I figured out, you know, there's something very wrong here because Kaiser Industries owns 40% of Kaiser Steel, they own 40% of Kaiser Aluminum, they own 32% of Kaiser Cement, they own Kaiser Broadcasting, they own Kaiser Santa Gravel, Kaiser Engineers, they own Jeep, they own business after business, and they had no debt. Now I learned this very early, this might be a breakthrough for some people, it's very hard to go bankrupt if you don't have any debt. It's, it's tricky, some people can approach that, it's a, real, it's a real achievement, but they had no debt, and the whole company at three was selling at about 75 million, at that point, it was equal to buying one Boeing 747. I said, there's something wrong with this company selling for $75 million. I was a little premature at 16, but uh, I said, everything's fine, and eventually this will work out. And they, what they did is they gave away all their shares to their shareholders. They, they passed out shares in Kaiser Cement. They passed out shares in Kaiser Aluminum. They passed out their public shares in Kaiser Steel. They sold all the other businesses, and you get about $50 a share. And, but if you didn't understand the company, if you're just buying on the fact the stock it got from 26 to 16, and then it got to 10, what would you do when it went to 9? What would you do when it went to 8? What would you do when it went to 7? This is the problem that people have, is they sell stocks because they didn't know why they bought it, then it went down, and they don't know what to do now. Do you flip a coin? Do you walk around the block? You know, <laughs> what do you do? It's psychiatrists haven't worked so far. I've never seen them running in. The, the, the psychological psychiatry fund I've never seen was, was for the, uh, with the SEC to make it through as a mutual fund. So I, they haven't seemed to help. Uh, I've tried prayer, that hasn't worked. The, uh, the, uh, so if you don't understand the company, you have this problem when they go down. Uh, eventually they always come back. Uh, this, one is, uh, this one doesn't work either. Uh, people think uh, RCA just about got back to its 1929 high when General Electric took it over. Uh, a lot of double knits never came back. Remember those beauties? Uh, uh, floppy disks, Western Union. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, people saying it'll come back. Well, it doesn't have to come back. Uh, here's another one you hear all the time. It's three dollars. How much can I lose? I have had people call me up saying, "I'm thinking of buying this stock at three. How much can I lose?" Well, again, you, you may need a piece of paper for this, but if you put uh, if you and if you put twenty thousand dollars in a stock at fifty, or your neighbor put twenty thousand at full at fifty into the stock, and you put twenty thousand dollars in at three, and it goes to zero you lose exactly the same amount of money, everything. And people say, it's three, how much can I lose? Well, if you put a million dollars on it, you can lose a million dollars. Just the fact that stock, this is the only, this may be a reason to research a stock. The fact that stock is three down from 100 doesn't mean you should uh, buy it. And in fact, short sellers, people that really make money in stocks, they don't short Walmart, they don't short Home Depot, they don't short the great companies, Johnson Johnson. They short stocks down from 80 to seven. They'd like to short it at 16 or 22, but they, f they figured out at seven that this company is gonna go to zero. They just haven't blown taps on this thing yet. It's going to zero. And they're, they're selling it short at seven, they're selling it short at six, at five, at four, at three, at two, at one and a quarter. And you know to sell something short, you need a buyer. Somebody has to buy the damn thing. And you wonder, who's buying this thing? It's these people saying it's three. How much lower can it go? You know, the, uh, the, uh, I, I, I love volatility. I, I think, I remember when, uh, in 1972, uh, the market went from uh, uh, down dramatically, and Taco Bell went from 14 to 1. They had no debt. They never had a, a restaurant close. And uh, I started buying at 7, but I, I kept on to it, and it went to 1. And uh, it was the largest position in Magellan in 1978. 
when it was bought out for, by $42 by Pepsi-Cola, and I think it would have gone to 400 if they didn't buy it out. I think volatility is terrific. I think, it is very, I think these calls are very important. I don't think the market going up 80 points one day and down 80 the next uh, is a good thing for the public. I think that's not a very good thing. But I think all of these callers and all these other things, to keep the volatility down each day is important. But the market's going to go up and down. Well, the, human nature hasn't changed a lot in 25,000 years. And some event will come out of left field and uh, the market will go down or the market will go up. So I, volatility will occur and markets will continue to have these ups and downs. I think that's a great opportunity if people can understand what they own. If they don't understand what they own, they can own mutual funds, try and figure out what mutual funds they own and keep adding to it. Over, basically corporate profits have grown about 8% a year historically. So corporate profits double about every nine years. The stock market ought to double about every nine years. So I think the next market's about 3,800 today, 3,700. I'm pretty convinced the next 3,800 points will be up. It won't be down. The next 500 points, the next 600 points, I don't know which way they're going. So the market ought to double in the next eight or nine years. It ought to double again in the eight or nine years after that. Because profits will go up 8% a year and, and stocks will fall. That's all there is to it. Your investing philosophy is often summed up as buy what you know. And there's some truth to that, and it's also often way oversimplified. Sure. Can you explain what you did mean by that and, sure, and what you sure. didn't mean? Well, I, it bothers me that people are, are very dangerous when they invest. This word play the market, that's a dangerous term. But if you do some work, do some research, know what you own, look at the, research, look at the balance sheet, you, if you could add eight and eight, get fairly close to 16, you find out this company has lots of debt, no cash, they're in trouble, you shouldn't own it. So a little bit of research. People are careful they buy a refrigerator, careful they take a vacation. And they, they'll put five, ten thousand dollars some stock to hear on the bus or to party. That's dangerous. So when you say buy what you know, you also thought that the regular investor might be able to get an, an inside advantage right. Right. by sticking to an industry right. he's a familiar right. with or seeing something right. that she realizes is a great right. product. I'm, imagine if you were in a mall the last 50 years. You would have seen Gap when it was hot, you would have seen Lemon when it was hot, you would have seen when it was not hot. You would have seen when they were starting, people weren't excited about Gap anymore. Or, or, then you do some research and say, well, gee, there's a lot of limited stores, but we're only at 20. You know, they can go to 400. So you, you, you see a company, I did really well at Dunkin' Donuts, a local company. I did well at Stop and Shop. But people could see that this is really some people showing up, or I guess the Sunglass Hut, no one's there anymore. So I mean, that's research. That's fundamentals. So in, but you don't leave the mall though and buy that day. You, <laughs> you have to do some more work. That's the important point. Yeah. So today, uh, there's so much information everywhere, information overload. Does that make it harder for active investors? The indexers say everyone's got access to the same information at the same time. You can't beat the market. Well, the way you beat the index is you, you avoid the stocks to go down. You avoid the steel companies and the oil companies and Sears and Penny and where the companies are deteriorated. I mean, companies are dynamic. The, the, behind every stock, there's a company. These are not lottery tickets. So we, you're trying to find the companies within the S&P 500 that are doing better. They're going from crappy to semi-crappy to good. That might take a couple years. Or they're going to grow for a long time. And you're trying to avoid the companies that are going south. That's how you beat them. Or you find some companies outside the S&P 500 that are, that are Great companies, CarMax was not in the S&P 500, they went up 200-fold. There's a lot of companies that enter, and a lot of their great performances before they go in. Now, a lot of people, when they're lucky enough or smart enough to get a company that's going up, they then they take their profits. Right. And, and you made the case in a book that you should actually hang in there with the really great stocks, and you even got a call from Warren Buffett as a result. Yeah, in 1989, I'm at home, and the phone rings, and I thought it was one of my friends, but one of my daughters, who was six years old, Annie picked up and said, Gee, guess there's a Mr. Buffett online? I said, this got to be a joke. So I pick it up and this, this Warren Buffett, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. You know, I read your book, my air report's doing two weeks, can I use the line? He said that all in about seven seconds. <laughs> and I said, that's great, I'd love to do it. What, you know, what's the line? He said, I love this, it's been waiting to do this. When you sell your great companies and add to the losers, it's like water in the weeds and cutting the flowers. And he said, I want to put it in. And he said, if you ever come to Nebraska, you don't call me. Your name will be mud all over Nebraska. So did he call him? Oh, yeah. Said, several times we played bridge together. We've had several meetings. Great guy. The single, uh, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say, the reason I own this is the sucker's going up. 
I mean, that's the only reason. <laughs> that's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10-year-old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. And that's true, I think, about 80% of people that own stocks. And this is the kind of stock people like to own. This is the kind of company people adore owning. This is a relatively simple company. They make a, a very uh, narrow, easy to understand product. They make a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point, data IO, IO array processor, with an optimizing compiler, a 16 dual port memory, a double diffused metal oxide semiconductor monolithic logic chip with a plasma matrix vacuum fluorescent display. It has a 16-bit dual memory. It has a Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicone emitter, a high bandwidth, that's very important, six gigahertz, <laughs> double metallization communication protocol, an asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleave memory, a token ring and change backplane, and it does in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of crap like that, <laughs> you will never make money. Never. Somebody will come along with more whetstones or less whetstones or a bigger mega flop or a smaller mega flop. You won't have the foggiest idea what's happened. And people buy this junk all the time. I made money in Dunkin' Donuts. I can understand it. I, uh, when there was recessions, I didn't have to worry about what was happening. I could go there and people were still there. I didn't have to worry about low-priced Korean imports. I mean, I just didn't have, you know, I can understand it. And you laugh, I made 10 or 15 times my money in Dunkin' Donuts. Those are the kind of stocks I can understand. If you don't understand it, it doesn't work. This is the single biggest principle. And it bothers me that people are very careful with their money. The public, when they buy a refrigerator, they get a consumer reports, they buy a microwave oven, they do that. They ask people what's the best kind of radar range or, they, or what kind of car to buy. They do research on the apartments. When they, go to, when they go on a trip to Wyoming, they get the mobile travel guide or California. When they go to Europe, they get the Michelin travel guide. People will hear a tip on a bus on some stock and they'll put half their life savings <laughs> in it before sunset and they wonder why they lose money in the stock market. And when they lose money, they blame it on the institutions that program trading. That is garbage. They didn't do any research. They bought a piece of junk. They didn't look at the balance sheet. And that's what you get for it. And that's what we were being driven to. And it's self-fulfilling. The public does terrible investing, and they, they say they don't have a chance. It's because that's the, way they're, that's the way they're acting. I'm trying to convince people there is a method. There are reasons for stocks that go up. Uh, Coca-Cola, this is very magic. It's a very magic number. Easy to remember. Coca-Cola is earning 30 times per share what they did 32 years ago. The stock has gone up 30-fold. Bethlehem Steel is earning less than they did 30 years ago. The stock is half its price of 30 years ago. Stocks are not lottery tickets. There's a company behind every stock. If a company does well, the stock does well. It's not that complicated. People get too carried away. And first of all, they try and predict the stock market. That is a total waste of time. No one can predict the stock market. They try to predict interest rates. I mean, this is a, if anybody would predict interest rates right three times in a row, they'd be a billionaire. Considering there's not that many billionaires on the planet, it's very, you know, I took, I had logic, so I had a syllogism and uh, studied these when I was at Boston College. There can't be that many people who can predict interest rates because there'd be lots of billionaires. And no one can predict the economy. I had a lot of people in this room were around in 1981 and 82 when we had a 20% prime rate with double digit inflation, double digit uh, unemployment. I don't remember anybody telling me in 1981 about it. I didn't read, I studied all this stuff. I don't remember anybody telling me we're going to have the worst recession since the Depression. So, what I'm trying to tell you, it'd be very useful to know what the stock market's going to do. It'd be terrific to know that the Dow Jones average year from now would be X, that we're going to have a full scale recession, or interest rates are going to be 12%. That's useful stuff. You never know it though. You just don't get to learn it. So, I've always said if you spend 14 minutes a year on economics, you've wasted 12 minutes. And I, I, I really believe that. Now, I have, to be, I have to be fair. I'm talking about economics on the broad scale, predicting the downturn for next year or the upturn or M1 and M2, 3B and all these, all these Ms. The, uh, I'm talking about economics to me is when you talk about scrap prices. When I own auto stocks, I want to know what's happening to used car prices. When used car prices are going up, it's a very good indicator. When I own hotel stocks, I want to know what hotel occupancy is about. When I own chemical stocks, I want to know what's happening to the price of ethylene. These are facts. Voluminous inventories go down five straight months. 
That's relevant. I can deal with that. Home affordability, I want to know about that. When I own uh, Fannie Mae or I own a housing stock. These are facts. You can, they're economic facts and it's economic predictions. And economic predictions are a total waste. And uh, interest rates, Alan Greenspan is a very honest guy. He would tell you that he can't predict interest rates. He could tell you what short rates are going to do in the next six months. Try and stick them on what the long-term rate will be three years from now. They'll say, I don't have any idea. So how are you, the investors, supposed to predict interest rates if the head of Federal Reserve can't do it? And history is the important thing you learn from. What you learn from history is the market goes down. It goes down a lot. The math is simple. There's been 93 years a century. This is easy to do. The market's had 50 declines of 10% or more. So 50 declines in 93 years. About once every two years, the market falls 10%. We call that a correction. That means, that's a euphemism for losing a lot of money rapidly. But we, you know, we call it a correction. And uh, uh, so 50 declines in 93 years, about once every two years, the market falls 10%. Of those 50 declines, 15 have been 25% or more. That's known as a bear market. We've had 15 declines in 93 years. So every six years, the market's going to have a 25% decline. That's all you need to know. You need to know the market's going to go down sometime. If you're not ready for that, you shouldn't own stocks. And it's good when it happens. If you like a stock at 14 and it goes to 6, that's great. You understand the company, you look at the balance sheet, and they're doing fine. And you're hoping to get to 22 with it. 14 to 22 is terrific. 6 to 22 is exceptional. So you take advantage of these declines. They're going to happen. No one knows when they're going to happen. It would be very, people tell you about it after the fact that they predicted it, but they predicted it 53 times. And uh, so you can take advantage of the volatility in the market if you understand what you own. When you were actively managing money, you presumably were under the same pressures as other fund managers to show performance results. Did that incline you to sell too quickly sometimes? Well, I think my greatest mistakes are, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny in a stock, all you can lose is 100%. I've done that. And your great mistakes are selling a good company and then doubles, then it triples and quadruples because you make a lot of mistakes. And so it's ones that go up tenfold, like on the 10 baggers. So some of my mistakes are just saying, oh my God, this stock is too high, and I was wrong. And you had to figure out, what inning am I in this baseball game? I sold Toys R Us way too early. It went up 20-fold after I sold it. I did the same thing at Home Depot. Those are probably my two greatest mistakes I ever made. When should you sell? Well, you ought to find out why you bought a stock. If you're saying it's a cyclical company and they're doing poorly, and they're doing awful, you wait till things are getting better, and they're doing terrific, and then you sell it. But with a growth company, you have to say, Walmart's case, 10 years after they went public, you could have bought the stock and made 500 times your money. You see, still are only in 15% of the United States. And you, they could say, why can't they go to 17? Why can't they go to 19? Why can't they go to 23? So for the next four decades, they went around the country. So you have to say to yourself, in this stock, I have a 10-year story, a 20-year story. I'll be able to write that down and follow that. And that's what I do with the company. And that's your decision. That's how you sell it. We have a novel element from many investors today in the trust issue. Yes. We also have security problems that we didn't traditionally yeah. have in America. Have they changed the way you pick and believe in stocks? No, you still buy a company, and you buy a company to grow. And if it's a textile company or it's an electronics company or a software company, you better understand what they do. And, and if they do well, the stock will do well, no matter what happens to the market. If the Dow Jones today was 1,000 or 500, you would have made a lot of money in McDonald's. You would have made a lot of money in Johnson Johnson. You would have made a lot of money in Gillette. These companies' earnings have gone up a lot the last 30 years. And if the market was 50,000, you would have lost money in Burlington Industries. I recommended that in 1969. I think it's, I think it's gone from 34 to 2 with no stock splits because the earnings have been terrible. Well, your modesty actually makes an important point, which is people with the best batting averages in the world don't bat 1,000. Yeah. I sometimes get angry mail, particularly during bear markets, saying so-and-so recommended yeah. such and such and it went down. Yeah. Well, uh, how often did you come up with a clinker? Well, this, this is a funny business. You don't have to be right even five times out of ten. If the times you're right, you make a double and triple, it offsets all those times you lose 20 or 30 percent. So when you buy a stock, you ought to say to yourself, how much can I lose and how much can I make? And you ought to be able to make a lot. You see, stocks are risky. I mean, look, look at how much we lost in AT&T. Look how much we lost in Xerox. These were quality companies. You know, you can lose a lot in a stock. So you ought to say to yourself, how much can I make? Because I want to buy a stock. If I'm right, I'm going to make a double or triple. Does your own confidence ever get shaken? Every day I think the market's going to go up. You know? <laughs> I keep calling a lot my company, so I keep calling the company.